Welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to talk with Ashley Jeffs, and he is the creator and maintainer of an open source project called Benthos, and it is a stream processing service. Uh, and it's a really, really cool tool, and in many ways, um, has a lot of alignment with uh, with what Costas and I work on in our day jobs. Uh, stream processing service written in Go, uh, and does a bunch of interesting things. I actually, Costas, have some technical questions because after reading through the documentation, it, it, he's made some decisions that are that are fascinating to me. Uh, maybe because of my lack of knowledge, but I think I'm most interested to know uh, what it's been like to maintain an open source project for five years, especially dealing with something that's pretty complex. Um, it's not a JavaScript plugin, you know, or, you know, not that those are uh, immaterial, but when you talk about stream processing and integrating with services like Kafka at very large companies, it's, you know, you're dealing with some pretty heavy duty technology. So uh, I'm sure that the emotional roller coaster of doing that for a long time has been interesting. And um, many times we don't get to see that. So uh, hopefully Ashley will share a little bit about that with us, but uh, what's on your mind? Two things, uh, two topics actually. One, of course, like we have plenty of technical um, stuff to discuss about. Streaming processing system is not the easiest thing to engineer. So um, there are many trade doors and many uh, decisions that you have to make there. Uh, so yeah, I'm really looking uh, forward to discuss like uh, the technical side of things. And then of course, I'd love to hear like his experience of being like a maintainer of an open source project for like five years. And from what I understand, like he's uh, the main and like more than 98% of like the contributions come from him. So he's very engaged with that. Um, so it's going to be like super interesting to hear from him, like uh, how he does this and how he keeps himself motivated and all those things. Well, let's dive in and talk with Ashley. Yeah, let's do it. Ashley, welcome to the Data Stack Show. There's no way we're going to have enough time to cover all the topics. So um, let's just dive right in. Give us just a, br a brief background on you, um, you know, brief overview of your career and then and what you do day to day. Hi, everyone. My name is Ash. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, so I am the core maintainer of a project called Benthos, which I've been doing for about five years. It's a data streaming um service it's decorative um and the idea is it's you know this operationally simple thing um and i started working on that uh around five years ago after working in sort of stream processing industry which i've been doing for about eight years so this is i i didn't used to call myself a data engineer because the term didn't really exist but um yeah. obviously that's pretty much what i considered myself to have been that whole time sure um and now that's pretty much my job is just working on this project um kind of indirectly but yeah, yeah that's my job basically okay well i want to hear more about that um one interesting side note i don't know if you've looked at the google uh search trends for the term data engineer but it's crazy it's like a hockey stick over the last five years um yeah which is really interesting you can see like okay this is kind of people were trying to figure out you know what to call this discipline. And then, you know, of course it's like formalized now. Well, tell us about uh, Benthos. Um, you know, you started working on it five years ago. It's a really cool tool, but tell us, you know, the details on what it is, what it does, and then uh, especially why you ended up creating it. So I kind of built it defensively. It's got two main focuses as a project. If you, if you kind of look at it, um, on the website, you have a quick five second glance. It's basically YAML programming um, a stream processor. Mm. And uh, the idea is that it's operationally simple. Um, what I mean by that is uh, the whole premise of this project is that it's super correct um, in every possible way in terms of data retention and back pressure and trying to be the least headachey item in your streaming uh, platform. And um, architecturally, that's quite difficult. 
um, and it's it's been a main focus of the project pretty much since day one. Um, and that's because uh, I was I was kind of working in a position where we were basically inventing the same product over and over again. We had this entire platform of a service that reads from something, does something to it that's usually a single message transform, maybe some enrichments hitting third party APIs, that kind of stuff. And then it would write it out somewhere. And we were plagued with development effort put into um, migrating services because they were all slightly different. And these weird combinations of different activities that each one was responsible for. Mm. Um, and we were just constantly rewriting these things to slightly change their behavior, you know, recompile it, redeploy it, go through all the testing hassle, that kind of stuff. So I was, I was in a position where I was kind of desperate for something to just be dynamic in that you can, you can drive that through configuration sort of declarative. Um, Cause these are usually just simple tasks. It's filtering transformations, some enrichments um, and uh, a few, few little extra bits in between, maybe like some custom logic that you can plug in and stuff. But for the most part, it was just stuff that you could just describe in a couple lines of config. Um, but we just didn't have that tool. So I kind of went on this weekend warrior effort to um, build what I would consider to be a solution to that problem. Um, our perspective at the time was that data was super important. It's basically our product. Um, mm -hmm. So delivery guarantees were very, very strict. Um, and also, uh, we, all, we were using Kafka all over the place. Uh, so this, this is about eight years ago. Um, so Kafka was, I think it was like version 0.7 at that point. Mm. Um, we were early adopting it and slowly migrating sure. it through this platform. Yeah. Um, and my take on it was if, if this thing is a disk persisted replicated service that we're putting all this effort into operationally running, Right. why would I have a service that has a disk buffer that is also operationally complex? Like if you get disk corruption or some sort of failure, then, you know, it's, it's a point, single point of failure that could in, introduce data loss in your system, potentially forcing you to do things like run backfills. So why don't we just have a service that doesn't need anything like that? It's, you know, it's always going to um, respect the uh, at least once delivery guarantees without any need for, extra state it's just going to do that based on what offsets it's committing and basically what you would call a transaction um and what is effectively the kafka streams api so you know what it's supposed to be doing is making sure that you never commit an offset that you haven't um effectively dealt with that message that's so passed on forward so you don't need a disk buffer to have that delivery guarantee um and then the other piece of that puzzle was making it simple to use so the idea is that you can slap a config together to create a pipeline. So this, this service is reading from Kafka, uh, performing some sort of filtering, uh, and then maybe applying some sort of masking, um, data scrubbing or whatever, and then it's writing out to NATS or you know zero MQ or something. Um, I can then take that config, commit it into a repo. And if somebody comes up to me and goes, oh my God, no, we need to, we need to stop writing to NATS. We're gonna change this to RabbitMQ now. Um, or this filter needs to change. We need to change the logic for that. I can just say, here's the config, change that. It's two lines. I can review it and then go. Um, and to me, that was, that was my way of ensuring that I would get to work on more fun things, uh, like the, the actual stuff that I wanted to be doing sure. um, at, at my day job. And then obviously that naturally progressed to me only working on the boring stuff uh, because now I'm the maintainer of the service that's doing the boring stuff. Um, <laughs> and that's where I am now. <laughs> An attempt to journey into the exciting that ends with a continuation of the boring. Inevitably uh, going down the rabbit hole of boredom. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, one, one thing day. actually that, um, one thing we've talked about on the show actually with several guests is that, um, and I loved as I was digging into your documentation, you say in multiple places, a defining feature is that this is boring. And uh, we've had multiple guests who have built really large scale systems and we'll ask them about it and they'll say, it's kind of boring, but it's, 
it works really well and it's extremely reliable. Um, mm -hmm. And so that really resonates with me because that's something that um, that's something that that we've heard a lot. But one question for you, and I know we're going to dig into this a little bit later, um, but there was certainly a point at which you made a decision for the project to be open source. I mean, sometimes when you're building this, especially to solve a problem that you're dealing with inside of a company, um, you know, it can sort of be uh, IP that exists inside of that company. Uh, what motivated you to, to decide to go open source uh, with the project? Yeah, so everything that I did in, in, in my spare time was like a learning exercise. Uh, I would always make open source. And that was just a habit of mine because I was, thing is, if, if, if I was planning to make something open source and know that it was going to get attention, I wouldn't do it because I was so shy or so nervous about somebody actually mm. looking at my code. Um, but what I did is because I was so cynical about nobody's ever going to look at this, nobody's ever going to know I put this on GitHub, I would put all my little hobby projects on GitHub. Um, so the, the idea of making open source from the onset was obviously like a, a nervous exercise for me, but it's also, you know, the, the excitement of maybe this is going to help somebody. Sure. Um, but the, the main reason why, so I, I mentioned that I, I kind of built this thing defensively for the company I was working at. Um, there was just so much going on at the time. So this was a company called Datasift. Um, and they, they were basically selling these fire hoses of social media data, the biggest one being Twitter. Um, and then filtering logic on top of that. So it's like lots and lots of stream processing back when everybody else was talking about Hadoop um, as being big data. We were like basically processing the Twitter file host constantly mm. for, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of um, uh, customer filtering data. Um, and it was this huge platform with all this stuff going on. And we were having to work pretty defensively to, to keep this thing going. Um, because our requirements were changing quite frequently because I don't know if uh, you've realized this, but working with social media uh, companies as a partner can sometimes be a little bit turbulent um, and they can do things like cut you off randomly and force you to pivot. Um, sure, but yeah, so APIs or change data without, yeah. You know. Or, or we just don't want to work with you anymore. Bye. Um, <laughs> your, your business is kaput. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, that's awkward. Uh, so yeah, we, we were constantly like having to churn what the platform was capable of and the teams were amazing. Like the, the, the engineering staff at DataSift were fantastic. Um, but it's still this huge effort and you've got all this technical debt sure. because you're constantly having to change all these services and what they can do and all the capabilities and stuff. So there wasn't any capacity really to, to work on something like this on company time. And in all honesty, I was working on it in my spare time for two years before it was really viable because at the wow. end of the day, like if you've got if you've got bespoke services that are built to do a specific task, to replace that with something generic is mm. it's just gonna be a challenge. Like to to build all the the basic stuff needed to have a dynamic system and then to get it to perform um at in terms of stability and you know throughput latency that kind of stuff sure. um is this massive effort sure. i didn't know that when i started otherwise i wouldn't have started it um <laughs> but then you know it it just it naturally progressed it was it was a hobby project that nobody was really interested in and then you know two years later i come back to the company i'm like hey this might be usable now can we use this please yeah um and it had already kind of got a bit of a life on on github at that point so i it yeah. just kind of carried on that way. Sure. And did the did the company end up using it? Oh yeah. So they they used it um, a fair amount in a few places where it was an immediate solution to a problem we had. We didn't just like um, nuke all the other services on the platform. Uh, it was a very careful effort of we'll slowly roll this out in places yeah. where we were going to have to do some changes anyway. Yeah. And then what happened is the company got bought by uh, meltwater okay and um it was uh awesome because we we had this streaming platform and the idea was we were going to sort of use that technology throughout they're yeah. a very data um sure. uh, heavy organization and they have a load of different teams um 
all yeah, working they're a big, completely they're a different company ways. And their products are, are pretty cool. Yeah, the 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 engineering teams there are fantastic. Um, and the thing is, they're geographically distributed, so they all do things slightly differently. They've got slightly different uh, best practices of how they work with their data, or they did at the time. They're probably more uh, consistent now. But um, yeah, so I I had an opportunity then to go to all these different teams and say, hey, you're looking to interact with our streaming infrastructure. Here's a tool that can rather than being blocked on us as a team enrolling you on this and and getting you onboarded with all this infrastructure changes and things why don't you just run this thing yourself and you can do it in your own time and we're not even in the loop uh, this this service will allow you to interact with all of our stuff um hit you know these enrichment services uh, oh. all those things and it it took off um so again it took a bit of time because you, you come to people with this generic service and yeah. I think because of the it's, I mean, it's open source and it's a generic config driven service. So immediately people start thinking, is this going to be like log stash? Is it going to take two minutes to start up? Uh, am I going to like rip sure. my face off over the config uh, format, that kind of thing. So people are quite skeptical. So it takes a while to kind of yeah. demonstrate to people that you're going to get value out of this. You're going to like it. Um, and I, I kind of became like an internal evangelist for um, you can use the service for this thing, this thing, this thing. And when people had use cases, I immediately jumped on it um, because, you know, that's that's the bread and butter of the project. It can't continue if I'm not constantly seeing new use cases and new problems to solve. So I kind of tried to um, sure. nibble on as, as many use cases as I could. Um, and... Do you think that part of that also, I mean, you have an interesting perspective in that um, you got to have a, you, you had very practical experience with streaming almost coming of age, right? Mm -hmm. um, because back when you were using Kafka, um, the idea of streaming as you're talking about it is actually still pretty novel, right? Um, yeah. In terms of uh, the technology. So do you think also to some extent the adoption of streaming technologies is a little bit hard, like evangelizing use cases in part just because streaming was still younger? Um, to an extent, yeah. So I, I kind of, it was kind of weird because I I started working with some teams and basically got Benthos to work in a batch mode um, mm. because there were use cases where it was like, we've got an S3 bucket and we just want to consume the entire bucket and then write it to Kafka uh, because all the other teams are using Kafka. So it, it was one of these situations where I didn't really think about it at the time as like, uh, oh, they're using batch. I'm not, this isn't a batch product. Um, I can't do that. It was more just a, a technical problem. That's pretty easy to solve. Basically, it's an input, just like any other streaming input. Sure. Once you're finished, you know, the bucket is exhausted. You shut down gracefully. Like it's, you know, it's not massively complicated. So um, there was an aspect of you have to do stream at this company because that's how, that's the data bus. That's the data infrastructure of this company. We cannot do what we want to do um, in a batch way, there's the volumes are just too big. Um, so, you know, this is, this is how we're going to solve that problem. And, um, I mean, uh, nobody at that company that I interacted with was particularly intimidated by stream. Um, you know, they were all excited to, you know, play around with this new tech. Yeah. Um, and then the thing is after that, so the, the project kind of grew externally and more organizations started adopting it. I have never been in a position where I've had to convince anybody to use streaming because they're just coming to me, you know, they, they've already yeah. got this infrastructure and they're looking for something to solve particular problems they have and sure. they're stumbling upon it. So I, you know, I'm, if, if somebody asked me, how do you convince a company to adopt stream? I've got no idea. I have absolutely no clue how to do that. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it, look, that's a really helpful perspective. And I think, um, especially in the context of social media data and I think some of the other components of, of things that Meltwater provides as sort of data products, um, mm -hmm. 
I would guess actually, now that I think about it, the demand for streaming was probably unbelievable because when you're dealing with that nature of data, social media platforms, um, you know, the streaming real time and getting updates, um, you yeah. know, as soon as you can to see trending is, is probably super important. Well, I have been monopolizing this. Um, I have a million more questions, but Costas, uh, we talked about some really interesting technological questions. So uh, yeah. jump in. I know you're, I know you're talking about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a very interesting conversation. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, let's start and like try to dive a little bit deeper into like the technical side of things. And my first question is, um, can you give us like uh, a typical setup, including Benthos, like how it fits with like let's say the uh, pretty much standard like uh, data stacks that we see out there? How do you see it deployed? Um, it's often used as a plumbing tool. So you imagine you've got you've got Kafka infrastructure. It's, it's very often Kafka that people are using it with. Um, there's also MQTT. Uh, is seems to be a growing use case. Mm -hmm. um, but it's normally a, a company that's already doing some stream work. Um, mm -hmm. And what they've got is they've got some services. They've either got other queue systems that other teams are using. Um, so, you know, we want to share data with some team from another company, could be just another team at their company, um, and they just do things differently. They've got a different schema, they've got a different um, stream technology, whatever, um, and they, they just want some simple tool that they can just deploy. They don't want to invest too much time into this partnership. Um, maybe it's a temporary one, maybe it's going to change over time. Uh, so they just want something now. It's going to solve that problem. They don't have to think about it. Um, it's it automatically going to have metrics and logging and that kind of stuff. It's low low effort, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then what tends to happen is you start using it that way, sort of defensively, and um, then you realize, oh, hang on a minute. Uh, we've got this other service that's just reading a topic and then doing some HTTP enrichment or maybe it's calling some Python script or something. And all it's doing is it's taking a payload, modifying it slightly, and then sending it onwards somewhere else. Um, we could just do that with this Benthos instance. Uh, so why don't we do that? Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of slowly grows from that point where you, you delete a, a project that you had to maintain yeah. um, and you've replaced it now with you know a couple lines of config and it all fits in this one service that's kind of neat. You can deploy as many of them as you want because it's stateless. Um, so it's, it's just it's just low effort. Um, so it it tends to be to begin with just a silly you know plumbing mechanism from one thing to another. Maybe it does a bit of filtering or something that somebody wants, and then they they slowly grow. And maybe uh, eventually people branch them out into different deployments with different configs and stuff. But they'll be doing things. I, I tend to call it plumbing. I don't really know if we've got like a good term for it in data engineering, but it's not it's not a clever task normally. It's it's usually single message transforms and integrating with different services. So you might be hitting like Redis cache or something mm -hmm. um, to get some hydration data uh, based on like a document ID or something. Um, or maybe you're hitting a language detection service on some of the content of a message, that kind of thing, and then enriching the data with that, um, that kind of stuff. But um, it's not it it's stuff that can sometimes be considered to be quite complex problems mm -hmm. and the reality is it's not it's just an yeah. integration problem and you you know you can put that in a nice config and then when things change when somebody says hey our service is going to change we no longer support that field or that thing or here's the new schema then you just do a quick change commit that mm -hmm. and it's um, simple to test that's very interesting. So, how uh, you said that like it's very common to see it working together with uh, with Kafka, right? So, um, Kafka, okay, there's a whole ecosystem of like tools around it, right? Um, how it's used together with stuff like Kafka Connect, for example, right? Which has like its purpose is in, in a way like to connect Kafka with other services or with mm -hmm. other streams then you you can deploy technically some um 
uh, let's say, uh, processing uh, logic on top of Kafka. So you can process like the data that, like it sounds like on Kafka, you can do everything inside Kafka at the end, right? Uh, or at least that's what Confluence uh, wants to happen. Um, so why, why, why do you think that someone who already has invested like in the Kafka um, uh, uh, infrastructure, they would also use um, Benzos? Like what's, what's um, I, I understand after you start using it, why you keep using it and like increase like the use, case, like the use cases there that you cover. But what's like the first thing that like will convince someone to start using Benthos? Does it make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, I think so. So the, I think the the main selling point, I think if somebody's got, um, you know, they've got JVN components and so maybe they've got Kafka tank, maybe they're using um, Apache Camel or something, and mm -hmm. then they've got some other logic on top. Um, I think what tends to happen when people pick Benthos, I mean, it, it's kind of difficult to, summarize because i don't get an awful lot of feedback from the community often um but it's normally an engineer that's making the decision yeah it's like a data engineer uh in in this context and i think their main frustration is they don't like building stuff they don't like having a build system for these you know transformations they've got um especially if it's really simple stuff and especially mm -hmm. so if they have to change it often um and they don't like the you know the weight of some of these components they're a little bit clunky they're a little bit awkward to use um, they want something that is is more friendly to an ops person so like if you're if you're on call and you know yeah. you're waking up at 3 a.m and something has happened you know maybe a server has crashed or something and it's part of your infrastructure and you can see in your graphs that you've had some sort of outage um like the horror stories of some of these components and waking up and thinking, oh, I've got now got to recover all of these different things um, mm -hmm. and sort out what the problem is. Uh, when they see this product that's just, it's just a single static binary, it doesn't have any state, you can restart it on a whim. Um, in fact, you can restart it constantly if you want, there'll be no data loss. Uh, when they see an outage, it's a simpler problem because you don't have to coordinate a backfill. You have to coordinate um, all these components slowly coming on over time. You just, you know, they, they probably already restarted uh, if, if your infrastructure is set up for that. And mm -hmm. you can just check on the graphs, uh, the metrics and things um, mm -hmm. that it's, it's worked. Uh, if there's a problem, you've deployed something that is broken, then it's just a config change. So anybody can look at that and, and get some idea as to what's going on. They're not reading code. They're not looking at, you know, something that got committed to some CI system and it's, you know, it was a full build that got deployed. They're just looking at a config change that got deployed. Um, so maybe there's like some mapping or something and they can just roll that back if it's, if it looks wrong, that kind of thing. So I think it, it tends to be engineers that are making the decision. Um, and obviously a lot of Go developers, I didn't mention that it's, it's written in Go. So a lot, a lot of people who are already writing Go services, it's a natural win for them because they can write their plugins in Go rather than Java. But in terms of like feature set, it's 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 a lot of overlap with a lot of products that already exist in the Java ecosystem and are, are more popular. Um, they're more widespread. So you know, I've I've never gone after people making those deployments. I would never tell somebody if you've got a happy system that you're using and it's using all these products. I would never tell them you should ditch all that and use this <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and and if you've got a bespoke service that you're happy with. And it's doing all the stuff and it's your code and you're building it keep it you know if if, if you're happy with it and yeah. you know, it's it's solving the problem then you should definitely keep that thing rather than replacing it with this weird thing that you've never seen before yeah but yeah. it's more it's it's this trade-off between deciding what you want to work on and what are your priorities as a team um yeah yeah and i think the declarative side of things is also quite important like i think it fits much more naturally in the workflows that like engineers have. Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. like quite a few times, like you can write like a config and I can review it, right? Like this thing that I can review it and then we can move fast and we deploy things and we can change things fast. Yeah. Like that has like a, a like crazy value when you are talking about like an environment that needs to be alive all the time. Like and at the same time you have like to 
create like you know the new logic that you need because things are changing constantly and all that stuff and i think that's also like a very interesting part of like the the data engineering as an engineering discipline because it's this like kind of crossover between like software engineering but ops at the same time you know you have all these different like yeah. facets of the, that you have like to do at the same time and you you really have like to pick like the best from each one and try like to create tools that they combine uh, the best practices yeah. from there. So yeah. I think that having this declarative way of like describing what should happen there, uh, it's it has like amazing value. So I can understand that, especially having worked like with uh, a JVM based like infrastructure. Um, so how you would uh, compare uh, Benthos compared to other like streaming processing platforms like Flink, for example, right? Or whatever else like people are using out there. What are like the differences and the similarities between the two? So Benthos is much more focused on single message transforms. So you get a single payload and you're doing something to it. You might have a batch. You can do batch processing. Um, so say like consumer window of 100 messages and aggregate them. But it's it's bread and butter really is is single message things. And the mm -hmm. the reason why I've, I've focused on that is because at the time that was the problem that I had uh, was just single message stuff. And there wasn't really an awful lot of attention on that uh, in the product space. We already had Spark at that point, mm -hmm. um, which was already solving you know the problem pretty well from what I could tell. Um, I hadn't used it, but it seemed like okay, windowed aggregations. That's you know that's a solved problem. We have a tool for that. Um, and what's the nice thing for, you know, for masking, filtering, transforms, enrichments, hydration, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think where, if, if I was going to compare it to, to these products, um, I would say it's kind of, it's, it's probably more similar to Apache camel. Okay. Um, and obviously Kafka connect as well, uh, to an extent. Um, and then the, the main difference is that it's, it's kind of declarative from the onset. Um, and like people like saying cloud native nowadays, uh, yeah. but basically it, it, it can be deployed in Kubernetes essentially mm -hmm. uh, without much hassle and um, that kind of thing. But then, you know, Camel, Camel's got uh, Camel K now. Uh, so, I mean, those, those services are becoming nicer to deploy, mm -hmm. um, but not like the kind of things that you could do with the Benthos config. Um, with with the the way that the the config is structured you could do crazy things like you can you can have multiple inputs fed into a single pipeline with their own processes and then have joined processes you can have multiplexed outputs switched on the contents of messages you can have fan out uh, all these different brokering patterns round robin you can have dead letter queues for processing errors and also when outputs come offline um all that kind of stuff so it's it's much more centered on plumbing um mm. which is why i kind of put it in the sort of uh, camel category even though it, yep. it it is a stream processor it does stream processing so you know it tends to get compared a little bit more with like flink and stuff it can do um window processing but that's not really what it's for it doesn't have um state necessarily it does window processing just by uh keeping it in memory and only committing offsets when that window is is flushed mm -hmm. so it's not I haven't done any like performance comparisons in that in that place because it's kind of like experimental at this point, but um it can do it. I wouldn't I wouldn't sell that feature of Benthos yeah. at this point. Yeah. All right. And then why did you decide like to implement windowing uh on the platform? Like why same reason I did most of the stuff. Uh just thought it'd be fun. Just thought, like, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff in Benthos that because it's called a stream processor and people will look at it and you know yeah. what I what I reveal on the front page is a stream process so reading from a streaming system does some stuff writes it somewhere um, but there's a lot of stuff in there that does not fit the stream processing category you can use it as an HTTP gateway if you wanted to it supports request response um, mm -hmm. I had to put that in because of NATS uh, which and, and also zero and queue stuff like that. So it's always had the ability to do, you know, responses uh, to inputs. So you can just hook it up as an API gateway. It has an API for dynamically mutating streams and having multiple streams. Um, you can use Benthos to drive itself. 
you know, there's, there's like loads of stuff in there that doesn't really fit the category. So I thought, well, I might as well put windowing in there as well. Um, it's really fun to just hear, you know, in the world of technology and data technology, especially when you think about, you know, sort of um, like San Francisco based companies that are, you know, trying to become really big. There's um, all, a lot of talk about product strategy and all this sort of stuff. And it's so wonderful to hear, like, I did that because it'd be fun. And <laughs> that just brings me great joy, Ashley. I just want you to know. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, yeah. it is a survival mechanism to an extent because because you're doing a lot of this stuff on your own steam you know I'm, I'm maintaining this project just you know just on my own will um so if in order to do that you have to have fun there is no way of maintaining a, a an open source project especially in the early years um it's just not possible if you don't enjoy doing it to an extent or at least i wouldn't want anybody to suffer that experience if they didn't enjoy it, because there's no guarantee of anything with with especially with open source, but also any business running a business mm. is the same thing. There's there's no guarantee that it's going to end up anywhere or anybody's going to use it. It could fizzle out. It could disappear. Sure. You you could just get burnt out and not want to do it anymore. So if you don't enjoy it, then what's the point? Like there's no there's no point in it. You're just punishing yourself. Sure. What, what, yeah. One question there. Which I'd love to just, um, you know, I think they're looking in from the outside. Uh, sometimes it can be hard to tell what the actual experience of, you know, building and maintaining an open source project uh, like Benthos is like. But could you just tell us about some of the highs and lows over the past five years? Um, you know, and sort of you're you're basically working with and on and, and consulting around Benthos full time now. Um, but what are some of the highs and lows that you've been through as you've as you've maintained the project? Which, by the way, I think also congratulations are in order because uh, that's a long time for a project that um, you know is still being used at, at, at large companies. So congratulations because that's a huge accomplishment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, the, um, so the highs are hearing that it helped somebody that's like when somebody gets excited about the fact that it solved this issue for them, um, that's, I, I get a deep satisfaction out of that. Um, and you know, you don't get it an awful lot with open source. Cause at the end of the day, most people are going to silently, you know, download it, use it, and you'll never hear from them again, especially if they're happy. The happier they are, the less you'll hear back from them. Um, and you know, I'm not, I, I'm not judging anybody for that. I do the exact same thing. I can't complain because I use loads of open source projects and never, yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not emailing the maintainer going, oh, I really enjoyed Grafana right. today. What, a, what an unvirtuous cycle. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the, those are the highs when somebody actually bothers to say, hey, this really helped. We can now focus on this thing that we want to be doing sure. it got rid of all these issues for us um thank you for 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 making this thing or if somebody asks for a feature and i get it out to them quick and they're, they're so thankful for it. oh my god that's amazing thank you so much um especially if it was low effort if it took me like five minutes and they're like uh, oh my god that's amazing you're incredible i get a lot of satisfaction out of that um the the lows are obviously bugs. Like if somebody's had a bug and you know they're they're um, you know they've they've had some sort of suffering, the behavior hasn't been quite what they expected, or you know uh, something's broken or whatever. Um, I I think so. I have a I have a thing. I can't I can't just leave a bug. I'll tag it. I'll label it on GitHub as a bug, and it gets closed that day. I can't I can't deal with bugs being known and not dealt with. Um, and that's mostly just, uh, I just can't handle it. I, I won't be able to sleep, um, which is, it's great because it means that I, I deal with them. I don't have a backlog of bugs that are constantly, sure. you know, getting worse or, you know, sure. um, interacting with each other, that kind of thing. But obviously that has, that has a toll. Some, sometimes I just want to enjoy my evening and a bug <laughs> arrives. And now that's, that's my evening. Like there's nothing else I can do about that. Um, yeah. but you know, they, they don't, to be honest, when you deal with bugs really quick, 
it ha- it does have an effect. I, I think there's there's obviously lots of blogs out there about uh, dealing with bugs as a team and stuff and how you should prioritize them and all that stuff. And I think that obviously I wouldn't say to everybody deal with bugs as soon as they're known because uh, that's just not practical, but it, it definitely has had a positive impact on the project. Mm. Um, the other thing is whenever anybody has a question, if it's a question that isn't already answered in the documentation somewhere, I consider that a bug. And I will, mm. you know, try and make an effort to 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 fix that either with a guide or you know fleshing out the component docs or something making some example or whatever um and that has been positive because obviously as a solo maintainer you only have so much time so you can't be answering questions constantly so it's 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 a defensive move in a way to yeah. always treat big questions as a, as a as a bug and just deal with them um quick but those those are the lows because I have to deal with it. And it's, it's, it's me. It's a personal issue with me. I could, I could get a therapist and I could deal with that. I've chosen not to at this point because it's not, it's not that big a problem. It's not as if it's every evening. I get like a bug a month or something. So it's not, it's yeah, not, yeah. but yeah. I guess if you were constantly lows. missing dinner, uh, yeah. it, w- it would become an issue. And then maybe, maybe you would, uh, call the therapist. My or... wife would not have that. She would not have me missing dinner. What I would do is I would go and eat begrudgingly <laughs> and then i would come back doesn't get in the way of family functions yeah yeah no, that's great that's great so okay let's go back to the technical questions again and then we can come back to open source because we have like uh, quite a few questions to ask there so let's discuss a little bit about like the architecture of benthos uh how you architect it uh benthos and what are the main components and give us a little bit of like insight uh of the choices that you've made in the trade-offs there and why cool okay so the the main premise of benthos as an architecture is that it's i i kind of called it a transactional model transaction means a lot to lots of different people now um unfortunately uh because i i used it as a very general term at the time but basically it all inputs in Benthos, obviously there's lots of them and they all have different paradigms for how to deal with acknowledgements and things. And um, obviously Kafka being the one that's most different to all the others um, in that it's just a it's just a numerical commit. Um, but basically every input within Benthos has a mechanism for acknowledgements um, unless it's lossy, could be TCP or something. Um, but they, whenever they create a message by consuming something, it gets wrapped in a mechanism for propagating an acknowledgement from anywhere else in the service back to that input where it knows how to deal with it. Um, and then it pushes it down a pipeline, which is Go channels. Um, took about Go uh, for, for hours, uh, but basically Golang channels are used heavily as a, as a way of um, essentially plumbing different layers of the service because it's dynamic. Um, there could be any number of processing threads uh, for, for the sweet vertical scaling. Um, there could be any number of different inputs feeding into one or more outputs. Um, so what happens is the, the message gets wrapped in a transaction, uh, it gets sent down a channel, which is also the mechanism for back pressure. If there's nothing ready to deal with that message, it can't go anywhere. Um, and then essentially that, that makes its way downstream. So it goes through a processing layer. They receive transactions of messages. They actually receive a message batch Um, But usually if you're reading a non-batched source, then it's a batch of size one. Uh, But all the processes can do whatever they want on it. If they filter it intentionally, so it gets removed, they call the acknowledgement. And then the input will do things like uh, either send that acknowledgement directly back to, if it's it's Google PubSub, then it will act that. If it's RabbitMQ, it'll act it. If it's Kafka, it'll mark the offset as ready to commit. Um, The important thing with Kafka, I'll go back and on that because there's a whole topic around how the Kafka input works. Um, But basically it eventually makes its way to the output layer. The output layer could be brokered. You could have multiple outputs. They could be multiplexed by logic based on the message. So what has to happen is all the different brokering types in Benthos, um, they're kind of composed. uh, So they're they're generic components in themselves. Um, You can compose brokers on brokers on brokers if you want to. Um, But they are responsible for essentially enacting the behavior that a user would expect by default. So if it's um, a switch multiplexer, you've got five outputs, a message gets routed to three. 
the message is not acknowledged until those three outputs have confirmed receipt. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some outputs are better at that than others. Um, and obviously, you can tune them to an extent. So with Kafka, you can tune whether or not it's reporting all the replicas were written to or not. But um, basically, you have some way of knowing that the message is successfully written somewhere. Then it gets acknowledged. Um, and then it's up to the input to, to do whatever. So um, most, most inputs, uh, so for the easy queue systems like NATS and GCP PubSub and stuff, where ordering isn't, isn't as important, people don't really consider that when they're, when they're processing messages from those. Um, you can just keep pushing messages down the pipeline. And if there's capacity, then it'll get processed. Um, if there's back pressure on the output, naturally it makes its way up to the input pretty quickly. And, and then when it's freed, the components gracefully uh, resume. Um, with Kafka, by default, um, partitions, topic partitions are processed in parallel. So if you've got 10 processing threads and you've got 10 topic partitions, you've potentially got 10 threads saturated. Not necessarily if they're not balanced well, but um, in theory, uh, you've got 10. Uh, but messages of a partition um, are processed in order. Yep. So your options there are you can batch them and process multiple messages of a topic that way. Um, or what you can do is you can increase, uh, I call it like a checkpoint limit, um, but basically how many messages are you willing to process out of order? And what I do there is I keep track. So if you say like we want to be able to process 100 messages um, uh, async, whatever order, we don't really care about that. We just want to process them fast. Um, I limit the number of messages and I track which offsets we've actually um, we've actually acknowledged. And I will only commit up to the point where all the messages from that commit number down um, have already been acknowledged. So there's potential there for duplicates. So say you process 100 messages. Um, yeah. the, first, the first one that went through the pipeline for whatever reason didn't hasn't been acknowledged yet because it's blocked somewhere. All the others have, well, guess what? None of them have been committed yet until that final one has gone. And that ensures that when you restart the service, you don't get uh, data loss. Uh, but then the trade-off there is that you could potentially get um, duplicates next time you restart it. So it's like the, the difficulty with the service like this is finding the common mechanism that's going to satisfy all these different input types with their all different uh, ways of handling acknowledgements and what, what they're typically used for as well. Yeah. Um, because obviously some people might want to do ordered processing with, you know, a queue system like NATS, but then most people don't really care. So um, you can kind of enable it, but by default, you're just going for throughput um, and, and vertical scaling. Uh, whereas, you know, Kafka, typically people care about the ordering and they want to do batched processing of some type. Um, so you you kind of manage it that way, but essentially what I've got now, I've I've had to refactor the components multiple times to make sure that I could do all this stuff. Um, but basically, they all kind of fit their own paradigm now. And um, yeah, yeah I, I think I probably missed a million things there. Uh, but ah, it's fine, it's fine. But a rough uh, overview. I have a question. Uh, how important? Uh, is ordering based on your experience with um, um, streaming processing? Uh, well, that's a good question. So uh, I do. So for me personally, it's never been an issue because I've never worked on a system that actually cared. Um, in event sourcing land, then it's super important. Uh, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, I've had obviously people come to me and, you know, have a discussion about how can we guarantee ordering? What about in the event of failures and stuff? If we're retrying messages, how do we guarantee we're getting the right ordering and stuff like that? Um, and I mean, it's a complex problem to make sure in yeah. all cases, every single edge case, you've definitely got the correct ordering. Um, but I think it is possible, mm -hmm. uh, just like the perfectly secure system is possible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it is doable, but, uh, I think mostly I would attribute that to event sourcing. So you're processing a stream of, of actions and you need to make sure that they're done in the right order because it has obviously an effect on the outcome. 
Um, but yeah, t- to be honest, I would have normally traditionally described Benthos as a system where it probably doesn't matter because you're doing single message transforms anyway, um, enrichments and stuff. But then obviously if you're using it to bridge um, between services and something downstream does care about ordering, then obviously it also has to respect ordering. So um, I did opt. I, th- I think some services have gone down the path of not really caring about ordering too much. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a way of of dealing with it. I am tempted in the next major version bump to reconsider whether or not I make it default um, because obviously it does make scaling easier for people if mm-hmm. just by default it is it doesn't really care and it's you know letting you use however many uh, processor threads you've got. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for now it's it's strict on ordering until you give it the explicit instruction to um, yeah. allow it to Sorry. process the Kafka house thing. And based on your experience, again, what's the main trade-off uh, that you have to exchange in order to have ordering, right? Is it just performance? Is there something else? You mentioned something about duplicates. So there yeah. are like differences there with delivery semantics also. Like, so what are the main trade-offs that an engineer needs to have in their mind when they opt for having strict ordering? If you don't care about delivery guarantees, then the main problem is just throughput is is how easy is it to do vertical scaling if you're forcing ordered processing and you've got you know a limited number of topic partitions um, because that's tied to your kafka deployment like you know the number of partitions is something that somebody else has probably made the decision of uh, you might not even have control over it so you on the processing side um oh you know i've got 24 cpu cores lucky me if there's only three partitions and you're, you know, you're doing ordered processing, then, you know, you're stuck. You've got three CPUs, unless you can vertically scale the individual message processor, then you're, you're kind of out of luck on that. Uh, but um, if you care about delivery guarantees, the forced ordering only makes it in terms of Benthos uh, you know, to a Benthos user, um, it just means you've got to configure one extra field essentially to, to kind of manually determine um, how much parallelism you're willing to go for. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the main, so th- because messages aren't persisted by the service, um, what, what it's doing is it's making sure that it's never committing an offset that would result in one of the messages that hasn't been finished yet coming, uh, being lost forever. So um the reason why you can potentially get duplicates there is because if you choose to process messages out of order with Kafka, um, then obviously that means that messages that came after a particular offset uh, could be finished and dealt with. The next service has already got them, and they're you know they've got a new life in the suburbs. Um, whereas you know some messages are hung up or whatever they haven't been dealt yeah. with for whatever reason, um, you cannot commit that offset. Mm-hmm. Because any any other act, if you commit that offset or you do anything else with it, then the next time the service is restarted, you know, you, you're not going to consume those messages again. So like the whole, like basically with Benthos land, you have to be strict because I'm not, I'm, I'm not maintaining a, a disk persisted buffer or anything like that. So those messages don't exist anywhere else. I'm using Kafka's uh, disk persistence um, for, for that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where my my role is to basically document how what's what's the symptom of doing that. Like if you want to get better CPU scaling, uh, what is the solution to that thing? Because right now there's a guarantee that you might not want, yeah, uh, you might not care about. So do you have any plans like, or you are considering uh, to add like some kind of state that could like help with these kind of situations, or you are like absolutely. Uh, you have absolutely decided that it's going to be stateless, like Benthos is going to be stateless. I did actually have, so the, the first, before I went to version one, uh, so for, for like three years or something, I did have a disk buffer as an optional. So uh, the reason why that's particularly useful is, is, is if you've got a chain of lots of services that uh, are synchronous, so imagine you've got HTTP to HTTP to HTTP to zero and Q or something, um, because of the acknowledgement system, there's no disk buffer in any of those individual components. It means the acknowledgement has to propagate all the way up. So it's the same problem that people get with um, massive microservice architectures where uh, the service that begins the request chain has to wait 
forever um, and any disconnects you know cause cause a duplicate um, so I did have a memory um, a memory buffer is still in and I had a disk buffer as well um, I got rid of it because I thought well I'm not sure anybody needs it I just want to see if I can get away with not having it uh, and nobody asked for it back so I just never it's actually still there in the code base uh, because I, I wasn't sure if somebody was using it as or like a library or something yeah. um, so I've, I've left it there just in case it's being used in somebody else's project but it's not it's not in the code base um, and to be honest I think I like the idea of having to solve the, essentially in order to not have state in order to not have this operational complexity of some something that um, a person running the service has to know about. Um, you know, we're using the disk for this thing, so don't delete that. And if the disk is corrupt, you're gonna have to follow this step, this step, this step. And if, if the server crashes, you're gonna have to do a backfill. Um, and we don't know for how long, uh, you know, in order to avoid that, the burden's on me to make a stateless version of that same feature functional. And it normally ends up just being, I've got to be more considerate with how I do things. So in the, in the, in the basic stream processing world where it's, it's just about acknowledgements, the burden is on me to solve having a transactional acknowledgement system and also being able to vertically scale and also being able to do things like batch uh, sends and all this other stuff. Because when you've got a disk buffer, that stuff is easy. You write it to the disk buffer, and when you're done with it, you delete it from the buffer. Um, it's more difficult in, in my world because uh, in order to do things like, um, you know, nice back pressure and shutting down gracefully, uh, all that stuff, I have to be super strict about when are we going to allow things to, um, to close and uh, what happens if, you know, messages haven't been acknowledged uh, when we're shutting down. Um, how are we going to read N messages from the SKU system? Um, without necessarily acknowledging them immediately. Uh, what, are, what are the difficulties there uh, for each of the individual queue systems? Um, but I, I kind of, I feel like that's, that's my role as somebody building a, a generic service is it, th that's my problem yeah. because I've accepted that problem. Like I've accepted the, the, the role of giving you this generic tool yeah. And therefore, if I didn't try my hardest to make this thing stateless and easy to deploy, I haven't really done my bit. I've, I've not yeah. fulfilled my role. Like if I just give you a service that's as complicated as, uh, you know, something that you would have made easily is, and the config system is just as complicated as, as your code would have been, just use your code. Like the, why yeah. would you involve me in the equation at all? There's, yeah, I, I'm not totally. doing anything for you. I'm not, I'm not fulfilling any purpose here. Yeah. Um, so why am I, why do I exist? Usually, um, I ask myself that every day. <laughs> well, that's a whole other podcast episode, but usually, <laughs> um, usually when you encounter something boring, it's because there's a lack of opinion. And so this is an ironic situation where uh, the, the characteristics, characteristics of being boring are actually because of like extremely strong opinions that you have to have about um about the architecture which is uh which yeah. is really interesting it's like it's it's more so it's it's super strict on the most difficult mode of operation because I, I i've got a lot of people who use it for logging they just use it for for moving logs around from their services where they don't care about data loss. If, if, if I told them we're dropping 50% of your messages, they probably don't even care. They just, you know, they're, they're just, it's just logging, who cares? Um, and I, I don't even think they know that it's got these strong delivery guarantees because they don't need to know. Cause it's, it's one of those things where I can be, I've, I've basically made a really strict decision to be super opinionated about something. But the important thing is that the opinion is it's not really burdensome for anybody. Um, it's not. It's not really a problem. And I think that's that's kind of where the trick is in these generic services: is to have have the opinion that is least hands on for people uh, mm -hmm. when they're coming in. Because if it was lossy, right, and somebody wants to deploy this, and it does have a mode of being not lossy, but you've got to read a manual to do that, it's a nightmare. 
it's you know you've you've got to you, the burden is on you as a user to make sure that you've plugged all these gaps that the service naturally has mm. to make sure that data is actually going to be delivered somewhere and that you're not just going to lose it on an outage that you hadn't foreseen um whereas on the end that i'm on where it's everything's super strict and it's it's locked down but you do get the you know vertical scaling and all that stuff people just don't realize like people are accidentally building these really resilient pipelines um unbeknownst to them Maybe they're angry about it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have I have a ton more technical questions, but we also have to respect the time here, and uh, we really need like to discuss a little bit about uh, open source. Uh, so I have a question that uh, I want uh, I want to ask you uh, about that. Um, you described how you decided like to make this project open source, right? Mm -hmm. um, this and it's been like five years now that it's, uh, the project is out there, so it's been like out for a while. Uh, can you describe a little bit how the traction happened with the project, or how you perceived that like the, the project started uh, getting traction? Was something that like you tried to do deliberately or like something that just happened because people were, I don't know, like organically finding about it? Like, how did you end up having like such uh, um, a, a popular project today? So I was really lucky. Uh, Primarily, I, I had successful open source projects before this um, in the I'd thrown a library over the wall and it got some stars on GitHub and people used it for stuff. Um, very hands off projects. Uh, and my method was just write something that I want to use and I think is interesting, post it on the Golang subreddit. Shout out to the Golang subreddit. Um, and then it might get picked up in some newsletters and that sort of stuff. And then I would leave it because once it has enough eyes, only needs a few, it will just pass by word of mouth um, was my experience. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to challenge that experience because I hate sharing my stuff. It seems ironic because of all the content I put out, but I hate sharing mm -hmm. my own stuff because I feel really guilty about it. I feel like I'm spamming everybody and, you know, uh, I'm going out of my way to force myself onto their screens. Um, so this podcast is ironic, uh, but that was oh. my experience up until this point. And, have, um, sorry for interrupting. We also have a marketeer here whose job is like to spam people out there, right? So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a very um, elegant way of describing my... Uh... <laughs> your job would give me so much anxiety. Uh, but yeah, so I, um, I had a project that... I, I liked, like, I liked Benthos after two years. I wanted to use it, um, but I wasn't convinced other people would feel the same. So I was kind of reluctant to really do much with it. I think I posted it on some forums and things, um, but I was really lucky because being at Meltwater, they were such a welcoming engineering community um, mm. that I was kind of forced out of my shell a little bit um i was kind of pushed and en encouraged a lot of like this is cool you should share it with more people uh people should see this thing um so i it, it kind of encouraged me to come out of my shell a little bit and start evangelizing it that was mostly internal um then i struggled because i hate writing blog posts and especially marketing -y ones um so I just didn't have the energy to, to go any further than that. It had organic use in the company. There were people who were, you know, the great thing about engineers with, with like word of mouth marketing is that engineers churn at such a high rate that you can go to one organization and, and kind of evangelize this product within like two years, half their engineering team have spread to other places and it's a virus. Like they're, you know, they're going to introduce it to all their engineering friends. Um, so word of mouth is, I, I think is is the main driver of Benthos. But there was one fateful day where I, so I made a video kind of outlining the rough architecture, um, specifically what I'd done wrong, um, put that on YouTube and um, put that on the Golang subreddit. And it got picked up by a couple of newsletters or something. And I got a bit of attention that way. And then uh, I tried posting on Hacker News a bunch of times, no success, 
no interest whatsoever. And then one day I wake up in the morning and it's on the front page and some random stranger had stolen my karma. Um, and it was, it was right up there and, you know, it got a load of attention. And that was, I think that was the first time where the attention was enough that after that point, I had a constant feed of new people coming in. Um, because, you know, obviously the word of mouth is a constant steady growth, but you need something to, to boost you to the point where enough people are seeing it that you actually have enough attention. Because I did have people using it up until that point, but it didn't, it didn't feel like it was enough to justify investing a lot of energy into this thing. It was a fun hobby project when I felt like it, but I wasn't going to like double down on this is definitely something people want um, until I saw that. Uh, I think that was kind of like a turning point where I, I, I put more of effort into kind of growing it and um, kind of trying to build out the community and, and things. But I would still say that the majority of the, the growth of the project is just word of mouth. I'm not like, I'm not paying for sponsorships. Um, I'm not, I'm not doing particularly well on, on blog posts still. Um, so it's just, it's just stuff like this, I guess. And then people, people, telling other people about it and, and growing the community. I think a lot of people see the graphics and then they want to show their friends and they want to get the stickers. And so that helps spread it a little bit. We got to, well, we need to, I need some background on this. So the blobfish, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it's, that's what it's called. It's a blobfish. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Give us the backstory. I love it. I mean, I kept smiling as I was going through the site and the docs because I would meet a new version of blobfish. Uh, every time and it's so great so the the all the libraries i used to make um so the things that i did before benthos and probably the stuff i'll do after it as well are always accompanied with some dumb logo because you've got to have a logo for your project right you've otherwise nobody's going to take it seriously um <laughs> and i i used to i used to i was obsessed with the idea of just having the the most unpalatable logo for something because it will be included when people vendor their dependencies. So the idea of companies that are serious and actually have a purpose on this planet, they're doing something important, having these dumb graphics somewhere on their servers. I just, I just loved it. I, I love the idea. One, one of them, one of the libraries I've got is, is, a, is a turkey um, just looking glam. Like it, it's just looking glam. And it's just a library called Gabs. And I just, I love the idea of people, professional people in a professional environment, you know, relying on this thing and seeing that graphic, uh, you know, once a week or something. You know what, you're, um, you're probably way closer to being a great marketer than you even realize. I just, I just... <laughs> it's definitely, I have to say, like, have it, the more fun I have doing the documentation stuff, the better it does generally. Because I think yeah. it comes off like people people love documentation that's just not very serious. It's yeah. laden with you know dumb humor and silly quips. Or none of my examples are serious in the slightest. They're all the goofiest, dumbest examples yeah. I could possibly muster. Um, but the, the graphic for Benthos being a blobfish was just me finding an ugly animal or a traditionally ugly animal. My logo is obviously. Uh, is the blobfish a real an a real fish? So, oh, this is a controversial topic here. Uh, <laughs> so, it it is. It's a real animal, and it's got a proper name which I don't know. Lots of people are going to be upset about that. I don't know the real name of this particular fish, and it's deep. It's a deep sea uh, fish. So, when you're looking at the picture of it, a, a blobfish, um, it's actually because it's it's been. Uh, depressurized because obviously it's in the it's in the normal atmosphere so it's not in a particularly happy way so really my graphic is a dead fish um <laughs> but <laughs> i've kind of, i've shied away <laughs> from calling it a dead blobfish and i just I, I just call it a blob nowadays it's just a blob with a face yeah um, but that's the brilliant thing about that particular logo because it's a blob you can put it into all kinds of different form factors Sure. And, and different designs, different shapes. It's perfect for um, marketing materials and swag. Now, who designs the different, because there's a lot of variations of the blobfish. Yep. Who does, there who's, are. The, who's the mastermind? Um, I, I do the bulk of them. 
I make the book. In I fact, I'm it. I'm I'm the brain behind all of the different variants and their particular equipment. Um, it's normally topical. It's normally you know for a particular um, example. And then my wife has uh, graciously helped me out with a couple of them, um, as she is a graphic designer, um, and she does that begrudgingly uh, because she doesn't like my. She doesn't style. like the black. Yeah. The blood bit. <laughs> she thinks it's a mockery of her career. Well, but there's no need like to dwell on very, that. It sounds like she's very supportive. It sounds like she's very supportive. <laughs> she's supportive. Yeah. But she's not happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, this has been so great. We're we're at time here. Um, well, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, really quickly. If someone wants to check out the project, uh, where should they go? Benthos.dev. And if you want to hang out, there is a Discord. There's a link at the top, community. Click that. It'll take you to a bunch of links. You can either join the Gophers Slack, where I've got a, a channel on there, or you can join the Discord server, which is all ours. That's where you can find Blobbot, the famous Discord bot, um, and, uh, and me as well on there. And the fabulous Benthos community is there as well. Great. And uh, if someone were really motivated to get Blobfish stickers, how do they do that? Do you have to make a commit? There are ways. There are ways of getting Blobfish stickers. <laughs> uh, if you do a blog post and let me know, then uh, you're definitely. It doesn't have to be related to Benthos. So you just do just do a shout out at the bottom of your blog post. Hey, by the way, uh, Benthos or Dev, I'll, I'll give you some stickers. I'm good with that. But you have to give me your address. I don't know if people are going to trust you with their address. Well, you're open source and your logo is a blobfish, so that seems innocuous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd much more readily give you my address than maybe like a marketer or someone. <laughs> yeah, from, from my perspective, I think that's the wrong call, but we'll let people make their own minds up. <laughs> awesome. Well, Ashley, this has been a really wonderful show. Um, amazing, amazing project. And uh, best of luck as you continue to build out uh, Benthos. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been, uh, been fun. Good luck with the uh, podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. But there are so many things uh, from that episode that, uh, that stick out. But, you know, as I rolled it around in my mind, um, I think the thing that stuck out, which we didn't talk about explicitly, but uh, the world of data um, internationally is so big. Uh, I hadn't heard of Benthos before um, we did the uh, before we started prepping for the episode, which isn't a huge surprise because you know I'm not necessarily the target audience. Um, but there are just so many teams working on so many different data products at so many different companies. And you have a tool like Benthos that's being used at you know, large organizations solving pretty critical problems. And it was just a good reminder for me of sort of the, the breadth of the entire market and how important data has become um, at every type of company. So it kind of it just made me step back and, and appreciate that. Um, because a lot of times, you know, you see sort of the usual suspects in terms of names around data processing, you know, Kafka has talked about a ton and, you know, all, all of these different tools and, yeah. um, to see, uh, a project like Benthos having an impact, it's like, man, it is really a big world and there's so many different cool products out there. Uh, and, and I love learning about the specific ways that, or the specific problems that Benthos solves. Absolutely. And uh, it's especially interesting with uh, Ashley today, because if you remember at some point, he mentioned that when he started like working on this project, uh, like his title wasn't data engineer because data engineer was not a thing back then, right? Uh, while today, like it's everyone is talking about data engineers. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, there are many tools and there are many tools that are actually um, exist because someone had the need inside the company to uh, automate their job uh, and uh, get like more time to work in more interesting things. Exactly what Ashley was talking about, right? 
Um, and that's like, I think part of like, let's say the charm of like engineering, like software engineering in general. Um, I don't know, I really enjoyed the conversation today. I think Asli is like an amazing person. Uh, he's a much better marketeer than he thinks, by the way. Uh, I think with- Totally uh, agree, totally yeah. agree. I mean, <laughs> the work he has done with uh, with the logo and all the content that he has created and everything, like it's it's amazing, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I would encourage everyone like to go and um, check the website, benthos.dev. Um, a lot of cool stuff, technical stuff, but also like it's it's overall like it's a great experience. Uh, so uh, even if you don't need like a tool like Bentos, go and check it out. Like it's, uh, it's amazing. And I hope that we are going to have uh, more time to spend with him because, um, he's a treasure of knowledge around like, uh, this kind of uh, very complex systems. And we have many more technical, um, discussions to make with him. So I'm really looking forward like to chat with him again in the future. Absolutely. Well, Brooks, will get it on the books. Uh, that's the show for today. Uh, give us feedback, um, eric at the datastackshow.com. Uh, and we'd love to get your feedback uh, and uh, any questions that you have about any of the episodes. And we'll catch you on the next one. 